all know how easy it is to create a Rails application, but what about when it comes time to share it with the world and deploy it? Well, the official site says deploying Rails is easy. And it certainly has gotten easier over the years, but it can also be very overwhelming, simply because there are so many different techniques and methods to choose from. One option is to deploy into the cloud with a service like Heroku. While I do love Heroku, I prefer to have more control over how the server's set up, and I feel like it can get quite expensive. My preferred solution is to deploy to a virtual private server through a service such as Linode or Webinode. Now for just 20 bucks a month, you can get a decent sized server that should have no problem hosting a small to medium sized Rails application. However, the tricky part is that you're pretty much on your own. They just give you a blank server and it's up to you to set it up from scratch. But that's what I want to show you how to do in this episode. First, let me briefly go over the production stack I'm going to use. For the Linux distribution, I'm going to use Ubuntu version 10.04. Now you can use a different distro, but you'll need to change some of the commands. For the web server, I'm going to use Nginx, but alternatively, you may choose to use Apache. And to serve the Rails application, I'm going to be using Unicorn, but another good alternative is Fusion Passenger. Now I covered Unicorn and Nginx in more detail in episode 293. And for the database, I'll be using Postgres, which seems to have a lot of attention lately in the Rails world, Alternatively, you may choose to use MySQL. And to manage and install Ruby, I'll be using RubyEnv, but you could also choose to use RVM or just to compile it from source. And finally, to host all of this, I'll be using a Linode VPS. A quick disclaimer, Linode does sponsor the hosting of Railscast.com, but they're not paying me anything for this episode, and I recommend them regardless. But really, any VPS you choose should do fine. Well, let's get started. But before we can deploy a Rails application, we first need to create one. So on my local machine here, I'll make a new Rails application, call it blog, of course, and specify to use the PostgreSQL database. Now, if you already have an existing Rails application that's using SQLite, and you want to switch over to MySQL or Postgres, just change the database YAML file to use the proper database there, and you'll also need to change your gem file to load in the proper gem. Now I'm going to generate some scaffolding for this application so that we have some dynamic content to test out once we deploy. So I'll just have an article with some, a name and some content. All right, now that we have our Rails application, it's time to set up our server to deploy it. Now I've already purchased a Linode server and signed in, so here's the dashboard. I'm going to choose Rebuild so that we can start from scratch. It'll be Ubuntu 10.04, and I'll just set a root password here and choose Rebuild. And I'll click on boot to uh, start it up. And I'll click on remote access here so that I can log in through SSH using this command. Now you may need to wait a couple minutes for it to finish booting, but once it's done, you can just run that SSH command to log into the server. And you'll need to type in the password that you set up earlier. And there we go. Now we're logged into our VPS. Now one of the first commands we should run is apt-get update to get the latest packages. Once that's done, we can install a few things such as curl, git, and something called Python software properties. And the last one is so that we can add repositories to apt. Next, let's install nginx. Now we could just do apt-get install here, but that version is quite out of date. And to get a more recent version, one solution is to just add an apt repository. So just run add apt repository and then type in ppa colon nginx slash stable to add that latest repo. Then we'll need to update apt again with apt-get update. And now we can run apt-get install nginx to get the latest stable release. And then with that installed, let's start it up by calling service nginx start. And then we could try it out by going to the browser and punching in the IP address to our server. And now we see the welcome message for nginx, it works. All right, let's install Postgres next. Now I would also like the latest version of this, so I'm going to add another repository. This one's called pitti slash postgresql. And then run apt-git update again. And then we can install uh, postgresql. In addition to the libpq-dev package, uh, this will help us build the Postgres gem. Now that might take a minute, but once it's done, you'll have Postgres set up under a separate user account. So if you want to access Postgres through the command line, you can do so through that account by calling sudo-u and then typing in Postgres. So that's switching to the Postgres user. 
and then you can type the psql command to access Postgres. Now it's a good idea to set a password here for the Postgres user, and you can do so by typing backslash password, and then typing in a new password here. Now while we're here, let's create a new user and database for our Rails application. We could just say create user, and let's give it a name of blog to match the app. Then we can say with the password, let's just say secret. And I'll also create a database uh, called blog production and set the owner as the new blog user we just created. All right, that looks good. Now Postgres is all set up. Now, if you want to send mail through your application, you may want to install Postfix. So I'll do that next, installing both the Telnet and Postfix packages. And this brings me to this cool dialog where I can choose a type of configuration. I'll say internet site, and then I'll just keep the uh, mail name at its default here. Now there's one more thing I want to install through apt here, and that is Node.js. And you're probably wondering why. Well, it includes a great way to execute JavaScript, and that'll help us with the Rails asset pipeline. Now I also need to add an apt repository for this. It's at uh, Chris Lee uh, slash node.js. And again, run apt git update. And then we can uh, install Node.js. All right, we're over halfway done setting up our VPS. The main thing left to do is install Ruby. But before I get into that, I'm going to first set up a separate user account because currently I've been logged in and running every command as the root user. So I'll make a new user here and call him deployer because we're going to use this to deploy our Rails application. And I'm also going to add him to the admin group so that he has pseudo privileges. And then I'll just give him a uh, password here and retype it, and I'll just fill in all these as their default values here. Yep, looks correct. And then I can switch to that user, su deployer, and then I'll just switch to my uh, home directory. Next, let's set up Ruby using Ruby Env. Actually, I'm going to use this little script called Ruby Env Installer. It's a lot more convenient than running all the commands by hand, and it happens to set everything up the way I like it too. So you could just run this command to run the script, or you can view the source of the script to see exactly what it does. It's pretty simple. So I'll just paste this in here and let it run. And then at the end, it tells me to add these lines to load rubyenv. So I'm going to add them to my uh, bash rc file. Now there's already quite a bit inside this bash rc file, but pay special attention to this line right here. That basically says it to stop loading this file if it's not an interactive shell. So it's important to load Ruby end before this line so that it works with Capistrano deployments. And then I can load in that bash RC file by running this command. So now we have Ruby end available to us to install Ruby. But before I install Ruby, it's important to run this command called bootstrap Ubuntu 10.04. And this is provided by that installer script. So this ends up installing a few more packages that Ruby depends on. So now we can install Ruby by calling Ruby env install, and then let's do version 193 uh, patch 125, which is the latest. Now this command will take a while, so grab a coffee and take a little break while it compiles. Once that's done installing, you can make that the default version of Ruby by calling Ruby env global, and then that version of Ruby. Now calling Ruby v, shows us that that version is set up and installed. Next, I'm going to uh, install Bundler and say no RI and no RDocs. And then run rbn rehash so that you're able to access that uh, executable. And it works. So now that our VPS is set up, it's time to prepare our Rails app to be deployed. Now one thing we'll need to do is publish the source code somewhere so that both our local development machine and our server can access it. Now I'm going to be using GitHub for this. So inside of my server, I'm going to attempt to connect to GitHub through OSSH so that it can be known as a host. Just say yes here, and there we go. So this way, when we deploy through Capistrano, we won't run into any snags with it being unknown. Now I have yet to add this application to GitHub. To do that, just go to github.com and then click on new repository. And I'll just name this project blog. And I'm going to make this a private repo to demonstrate that. And then this gives me some instructions for pushing it up. But our Rails application is not yet a Git repository, so we'll need to make it one. 
Now before I do that, I'm going to edit the .getignore file for the Rails app on my local machine. And in here I'll tell it to ignore the uh, config database YAML file because I want to configure this separately on the server and I don't want to put my database passwords in the Git repository. To go along with this, I'm going to copy the current uh, database YAML file so that we have a nice example uh, version so that we can copy. And now we're ready to turn this into a Git repository. So I'll run git init, and then add all the files, and then commit them uh, with a, a message saying initial commit. And now we can follow the provided instructions to push it up to GitHub. So I'll just paste this in, and then push it up to origin master. And then we can try reloading our GitHub project, and it's now up on GitHub. Yay! Now I'm going to use Capistrano to handle the deployment. So going to the gem file of this application, I'm going to uncomment Capistrano here, and I'm also going to uncomment Unicorn because we're using that as well. And then you can run the bundle command to install those gems, and then run capify dot to set up Capistrano in this application. So this created both a cap file and a config deploy file, and we'll need to edit both of these. First, going to the cap file, you can see there's a commented section here saying to uncomment this if we're using the asset pipeline. And we are, so I'll uncomment it. And then next we need to edit our config deploy.rb file. Now I'm just going to paste in my Capistrano recipe here, but I'll walk through it briefly. At the top, I'm setting my Linux server as the rules for the web app and database. And then I'm using the deployer user, and I'm going to deploy under the user's home directory under an apps directory and all the Git configuration is here. Now this forward agent option is pretty important. I'll explain that a little later. And then we have several tasks that I'm overriding here for restarting and stopping the server, and also for setting up the server and configuring it and doing symlinks on deploy, and also checking to make sure that we didn't forget to push up changes to GitHub when we deploy. I know I went through this kind of fast here, but I plan to dedicate a future episode to Capistrano where I'll explain all this in further detail. We're not done yet though, we still need to set up and configure Nginx and Unicorn for our Rails application. So I'm just going to make a new file under here called nginx.conf. And I'll just paste in the code for this as well. It's pretty much the same as what I covered in episode 293, so check that out for further details. Uh, one little addition here I added is this right here to use gzip for the asset pipeline. Next, I'll add a unicorn config into here. Just call it uh, unicorn.rb. And I'll just paste in the code for this as well, basically setting various paths and specifying how many workers to use. So you'll probably want to change this configuration. And then lastly, I need to add one more file here to start up unicorn with a shell script. So this is called unicorn init.shell. So I'll just paste this in as well. And all the variables that you might need to change are defined near the top here, so you'll probably just need to configure the paths to fit your application. Now that shell script will need to be marked as an executable, and we can do that by calling chmod plus x, and that script is under config slash unicorn init.sh. So with all that in place, let's add all this to this Git repository. Let's say deployment configs, and uh, push that up. Now it's time to cross our fingers and try running cap deploy setup. You may need to prefix this with bundle exec depending on how your shell is set up. Now it's asking me for the password for the deployer user because I'm logging in through SSH. I just typed it in and there we go. Now this setup script did several things. First it created a few directories on the server for the application to go into. And then in my recipe, I have it link a few files for the Nginx and Unicorn configuration to place them in the proper locations on the server. And then I upload the database YAML file so that we can edit the configuration on the server. And you can see it tells me right here on the last line that I need to edit that configuration file. So let's do that by SSHing into the application like that. And I'll type in the password and then I'll go into the apps a blog shared config directory, and then edit the uh, database YAML file in here. So I really only need the uh, production configuration here, so I'll just delete everything else, and I'll need to specify the password that I set when I set up this user in Postgres, and I also find it necessary to specify the host option and set it to localhost 
just so we don't get any errors when logging in uh, through the Postgres adapter. All right, so the database was the only thing I needed to configure here, so I'll just log out of the server. Now you may have noticed that every time we SSH into the server, we need to type in the password, and that can get quite annoying to do every single time we deploy. Well, here's a quick command you can run to copy the contents of the public RSA file into the deployer's authorized keys. And you probably have this public file already if you've uh, set up GitHub. So this means after we run this command and then type in the password one more time, and then we try to SSH again into it, we won't have to type in the password when we log into the server. Really nice. Now another thing we have to run regarding SSH is this command called SSH add. Now this will get SSH agent working, which is that forward agent option that we passed into Capistrano. What this will do is give our server access to our GitHub repository when we're SSH'd into it. This means we don't have to set up a deploy key on GitHub to authorize the server. Now on macOS 10, you can run this command with the dash capital K option, which will add the passphrase to your keychain. And that's all you have to do to get SSH agent working. Now we're all set up and ready to deploy. Let's try this out by running cap deploy cold and just let it go. Now a cold deploy will run the migrations and do a server start instead of a restart. And it looks like it completed successfully, but rarely will it work the first time. Usually you'll get some errors here and you'll just need to look through the output to find out what the error message is. And you may need to run the failed command directly on the server to try to debug it. Now the server still shows this welcome to nginx message because the default site is still enabled. To fix this, we can just SSH into the server and run this command sudo remove uh, etsy slash nginx slash sites enabled slash default. And this is just a symbolic link, so don't worry too much about removing it. And we can also restart nginx by calling sudo service nginx restart for it to pick up that change. Now, while we're here, there's one more command I want to run so that Unicorn starts up properly when our server restarts, and that's called update-rc.d, and then we need to follow it with the name of the Unicorn service, which is unicorn underscore blog, or whatever your application name is, and then just pass in defaults as the next argument to get it all set up. And now for the moment of truth. I'll try reloading this page here. There's our Rails static index page, and visiting articles path shows our article scaffolding, where we can create a new article. Let's try it out, and it works, yay! Now let's try committing a change and deploying it. I'll just edit the index template for the articles and just add a two at the end. And let's commit that, adding a two, and uh, push that up to GitHub, and then run cap deploy to redeploy it. And once that deploy is done, I can just reload this page, and there's my two, yay, it works. Now I've covered a lot of commands in this episode to set up the server, but I'll provide these in the show notes so you can easily copy and paste them. And as a bonus, I'm including an alternative setup using Apache, MySQL, and Fusion Passenger. So you can mix and match these solutions to your liking. So that's part of the beauty of a VPS. Well, that's it for this episode on deploying a Rails app. Thanks for watching. I hope you find it useful.